if autumn was a person what might they be like let's find out <laughs> How's it going Revision Squad? It's me, Liam, aka Mr Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and today I'm back with some more poetry analysis for you. This video, as I'm sure you can tell by now, is for John Keats's poem To Autumn, which appears on page 16 of your WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology. Before we get too much further into the video, I recommend that you have your anthology out and open to page 16, a pen for making notes, at least three different highlighters, and some extra paper too, just in case you run out of note space. Okay, so if you've watched any of my other videos in this series, you should know the drill by now. But if somehow you've not watched any of these videos yet, then a link to the playlist that they all appear in should be appearing on screen about now. So how about you click it and go through all of the poems in the anthology? Okay, so in this video I will read the poem, go through its context, provide a close reading, consider the poem's meaning, mood and poet's motivation. I will also think about themes and then finally at the end of the video there will be an optional written task for you to complete. I'm trying to get through this slide quicker than normal. If this video does help you with your GCSE revision, then please do consider dropping it a like and subscribing to my channel, Dystopia Junkie. That way, all upcoming revision content will end up in your subscription feed. And hey, if you turn on that notification bell, you'll even receive a notification whenever I drop a new video. So that way, you can't miss it. Okay, so that generic, cringy YouTuber stuff aside, here is the poem. Make sure that you follow along, either on screen or, you know, using a copy of the anthology. As you can see, I have had to chop the poem up a little bit, but that's just purely an aesthetic thing. It's still the exact same poem. To Autumn Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells who hath not seen the oft amid thy store sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind or on a half root furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day, and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourne, Hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. So there we go, that is the poem. Let's dive straight into the poem's context. I'm hoping you know why that's important by now. 
So John Keats is one of the most significant romantic poets, just like Lord Byron and Percy Bysshe Shelley, who also appears in the anthology. I will explain what is meant by romantic with a capital R in a later video, probably in my video for the prelude, so keep an eye out. But in short, romantic, again with that capital R, does not mean lovey-dovey romance, but is instead derived from the term romanticism. Romanticism is a movement in the arts that places emphasis on everyday people, strong senses, emotions and feelings, the beauty and power of nature, and the importance of imagination and inspiration. Which of these aspects of romanticism feature in To Autumn, I wonder? So both of Keats's parents died before he was 14. He was sent to live with his grandmother. There's some similarities here between Keats and a romantic great before him, William Wordsworth. Did difficult family lives make these men turn to writing or make them turn to nature? Keats often suffered with money troubles. He found money troubles particularly difficult in the autumn of 1819, which is when he was writing this poem. And this poem was inspired by a real life event. Keats walked alongside the River Itchen, which is near Winchester, on the 19th of September 1819. How awfully romantic of him. Hey, it's Liam from the future here. Um, I'm actually in the process of editing this video at the moment, but I noticed a very funny coincidence. 19th of September, 1819, was the day in which Keats went down by the River Itchen. Today, September 19th, 2019, 200 years later, and I'm editing and uploading the video for To Autumn. Wasn't planned whatsoever, but what an amazing coincidence. This was the final significant poem of Keats's writing career. Plagued with money troubles, Keats turns to more serious and financially lucrative work. I wonder if an awareness of this creeps into the poem somewhere. And finally, aged only 25, which for me personally is quite scary because that's how old I am. Keats died of tuberculosis. Okay, so just one last thing before we get into analysing the poem. A quick glossary. This is one of the older poems in the anthology and so its language is a bit archaic in places. So as I provide the meanings of these words, you might find it useful to make notes if you don't already know the meanings of them, of course. Okay, so a bosom friend is just a close friend. Thatch eaves are the part of a thatched roof that hang over the wall. A gourd is a type of fruit. Uh, it's the sort of family of fruit that includes pumpkins and squash. The kernel is the bit of a nut that you eat. Cells in this case refers to part of the bee's honeycomb. Winnowing is the act of blowing air through grain to get rid of the inedible bits. A furrow is a line in the earth made by a plough. A swathe is a line of reaped crop. A gleaner is a collector of fallen grain. Sallow are type of willow trees. Born in this case means a small stream or boundary. And treble is a high pitched singing voice. So hopefully you can pause the video now if you want to get those meanings down, if you don't know those words or they're not so familiar to you. But I thought I'd provide them to us now so that when we get into analysing the poem, it's going to make a little bit more sense for us. So hopefully that has helped you. Right then, so now that we've read the poem, we've considered its context and we've even deciphered some of its more archaic language, we can begin to analyse it. 
Now is your chance to grab those highlighters and to set up your own key. Remember, one colour for imagery, one for language, and a third for structure. A poem's title is a potential source for analysis, and this poem is no different. So this time, we're going to think about what the poem's title might suggest about its form. This is probably one of those ones where you either know the answer or you don't, but give it a go anyway. See if you can come up with an idea or, you know, even Google an answer. See if you can do some research. The title suggests that this poem is going to be an ode, which is a specific type of poem. Odes are lyric poems that are meant to be sung and are often sung in praise of a specific person or thing. So this gives us a clue about the poem's structure, whilst we can also use a bit of context here. Doesn't it make sense for a romantic poet to be singing the praises of autumn, the season that brings so much joy and life to humanity? Okay, so here we have the poem's first stanza. We have a few questions to consider here, and it would be useful for you to try to answer them first before you move on to my annotations and ideas. So in total, we have one, two, three, four questions for this stanza. Have a read and a think and make some of your own notes. Of course, feel free to tell me some of your ideas down in the comment section below. So I've highlighted a bunch of words and phrases and even a bit of punctuation that I think help to create a celebratory tone in this opening stanza. The words are either overtly positive and are being used as praise or they have positive connotations. I've even highlighted an alliterative phrase, which could also count as structure, I guess, that sounds celebratory. The images in the fourth and fifth lines show that man and nature have an almost symbiotic relationship as they live in close proximity, almost alongside each other. The vines line the cottage roof. The cottages have apple trees in their gardens. This seems to be a very peaceful coexistence. There is an absolute abundance of nature images in this stanza and I've only highlighted some of them. I think Keats has done this to mirror the abundance of autumn. Remember that autumn, especially at the time Keats was writing, is a time of harvest, a time of reaping the crops that had been planted earlier in the year, a sudden time of plenty. And that idea of autumn being a time of abundance and plentiness is something we can also see in the poem's structure. The structural comment here is one that you can also make for the other two stanzas. The additional line in this stanza and in all of them means that it is slightly overflowing, just like how autumn overflows with life and bounty. After all, odes are supposed to have 10 lines per stanza, and yet here we have that 11th line. It is extra, it is full of life, it is overflowing, just as autumn does. And here we have the poem's second stanza. Before we see the questions for this one, remember that the structural comment we've just made on the previous stanza also applies to this one. The 11th line could represent how full and overflowing autumn is. So for this stanza, we have one, two, three, four questions. How about you give them a go and then resume the video? The top line of this stanza seems a bit archaic, but all it really means is who doesn't often see you in their storehouse? 
Obviously, this question is rhetorical, as this poem is a monologue and nobody else can answer it. But in asking this rhetorical question, the speaker of the poem seems to be pushing for the answer. Nobody. Meaning that everyone sees autumn often in their storehouse, suggesting that it is a keen helper during harvest. Autumn is personified throughout this stanza, and in this image in particular, it has been compared to the Grim Reaper, as it has a hook, which is a bit like the Grim Reaper's scythe. By comparing Autumn to the Grim Reaper, Keats is suggesting that death is never too far from Autumn, or even that the two are strongly interconnected. If you were to say that something took hours and hours, it would firstly mean that it took a long time to do, but also that it felt like time passed very slowly. By having this repetitive phrase in a stanza so focused on physical labour, Keats is perhaps suggesting that the hard physical labour that the workers endured was difficult, repetitive and strenuous. My annotation for the final question is quite lengthy, but I make no apologies for that, as I think it's a really important idea that could lend itself nicely to your analysis of this poem. So we have images of work throughout this stanza, including granary floor, half-reaped furrow, hook, gleaner and cider press. If I were you, I'd probably highlight those with the same annotation, images of work. At the same time, images of rest in this stanza could include sitting careless, sound asleep and drowsed. And again, if I were you, I'd highlight those three phrases, make the same annotation for them, images of rest. Now, this combination of images of work and images of rest have the effect of personifying autumn as a fellow worker and as somebody who is maybe working themselves to exhaustion. Autumn is working as hard, if not maybe harder, than man during harvest. And here we have the poem's final stanza. And there are one, two, three, four, five questions that I'm going to be considering in relation to it. If you would like to pause the video now to make your own annotations, now would be the ideal time to do just that. So this is where I do the bit where I say that I'm sorry to say that you're going to have to wait a bit longer for the answers to those questions. And the reason why is that this is the end of part one of my analysis of To Autumn. So why not work on those questions on your own for a bit? Have a think about them, make some of your own annotations, so that way when we come back to part two, which is going to drop really soon, you're going to have multiple interpretations of the same ideas, which is really useful for getting the top grades. Of course, to make sure that you don't miss out on part two when it drops, I do recommend subscribing to this channel and turning on that notification bell as well. So that way you'll be alerted as soon as it does indeed drop, which will be really soon. I do promise you that. Anyway, as ever, have an awesome rest of the day and thank you so much for watching. Cheers.